Hello and welcome to Within the Frame. I'm your new host, Han Daeun in Seoul. South Korea's birth rate, the lowest in the world, continues its downward spiral, shattering its own records. The rates are so low that it's sparking stark warnings from academia and institutions across the globe, with major foreign news outlets dissecting reasons why Korean women aren't having babies. Korea is on track for serious economic consequences if the low rates are left unresolved. What's continuing to drive down the numbers and what more should be done to reverse the decline? For some clues, we've invited two special guests today. Hwang Myung-jin, professor of public administration at Korea University, now joins us via Zoom. Thank you so much for making time. Thank you for having me. Also joining us tonight from Milan is Francesco Bellari, professor of demography and rector of the Bocconi University. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. I want to start with you, Professor Huang. South Korea's total fertility rate, the number of children a woman is expected to have in her lifetime, plunged to 0.65 in the fourth quarter of last year. Statistics Korea projects the annual fertility rate to drop further to 0.6 this year. What does the figure 0.6 entail? Well, uh, I have no idea what to tell. The thing is that it's been uh, continuously declining, and we really hope for uh, any uh, the hitting the bottom line uh, in what the uh, TFR rate will be. And uh, our anticipation uh, among many of the demographers, myself, we uh, keep uh, failing to anticipate uh, uh, the, uh, the for, uh, population fertility forecast. What it means to us uh, in our society is, uh, of course, first thing is uh, economic consequences and uh, labor market uh, shortages, uh, labor supply shortage, and uh, uh, consumer market uh, uh, shrink, and uh, uh, population aging, uh, and the educational uh, problem due to the the, the population uh, structure changes. But what more important thing uh, we have uh, focused on our recent study is uh, gender equality and the work-life balance. These two things are not really uh, making any progress, even though uh, government and uh, employers and many others uh, uh, societal uh, uh, stakeholders uh, pursue to change in our society. So it's totally a failure of our uh, collective and societal effort uh, to move the forward and improvement of our uh, society in a better way and with more uh, social welfare and uh, generally uh, uh, equal society. That's what I think. The figure is so low that even for experts like you have no idea what the figure entails. Some experts have even likened the rapid drop to black death in Europe in 14th century, um, sending stark warnings against the dwindling figures. 0.6, the lowest in the world, a figure that even the world has not seen before. But the Korean government says it still has hope, which leads uh, to our next question, Professor Bellari. Korea saw an increase in the number of marriages after the COVID-19 pandemic technically shifted to an endemic, and the Korean government is pinning hopes that the, the rise could help improve the country's bleak birth rate figures. Then could the rapid plunge in total fertility rate to the 0.6 range be a temporary phenomenon? It could. Uh, we have seen uh, a level of 0.7 in Europe, in uh, Eastern Germany in particular. Uh, the fertility rates recovered since then. Uh, so it could be a temporary phenomenon. And uh, the phenomenon you indicated, a uh, uh, marriage boom, uh, could contribute to increasing fertility rates. However, uh, the issue is uh, it depends on whether the structural uh, constraints that are uh, pushing fertility down are resolved. In the case of Eastern Germany, uh, the economic situation was uh, bleak during the German reunification and the prospects were better for the future. So. Uh, 0 0.7 was a sign of uh, postponing births to a better future. 
so it really depends on whether uh, Korean couples have decided to wait, in which case uh, uh, there will be a recovery, or whether the current rates are reflecting long-term plans, in which case uh, there needs to be a serious policy intervention and a reflection on the broad causes. Uh, my distinguished colleague has, has already attached uh, the general issue. There is no uh, single answer. But so we have seen recoveries from these levels in the past, uh, but there is no guarantee the levels will be recovered automatically. So it could be temporary, and you've cited Germany's example, but again, it'll all depend on various uh, social variables. Now, staying with you, Professor Bellari, Italy also faces a long-standing demographic crisis with a number of births continuing to head for a new record low. According to Italy's National Statistics Bureau, ISTAT, births fell 1.7% to 393,000 in 2022, hitting the lowest since the country's unit in 1861. What are the main causes driving the numbers down in Italy? Italy had the lowest level in the world in the mid 90s. So we were where Korea is now, kind of the, the world record holder of low fertility with 1.19 at the time. 1.2 was the lowest in the world in 95, 96. Uh, one of the causes of what's happening now in Italy is that uh, these low levels are reflected years later in the number of uh, potential mothers and fathers. So now Italy is also paying the consequences of the low fertility of the 80s and the 90s. So we don't have many uh, people in reproductive ages. Uh, and this is combining the current levels of fertility, which are still around uh, 1.2, so well above Korea, but very close to 1, still uh, worryingly close to 1. But these are applied to a population that is uh, shrinking. So the potential number of uh, fathers and mothers is shrinking and the number of births per couple are still the same. So the number of births is a product of how many couples are there times the children per couple. That's why we have the, this record. This is also indicating that in the future, Korea may face exactly the same constraint. It takes time to recover from that because if you have already a low known number of father and mothers, you cannot change that quickly, if not via immigration. But could you give us more specific examples of why Italian couples are refusing to have a child? I think the examples in the literature are consistent. Uh, gender equality has been mentioned, work-life balance, the fact that this, this is not only for Italy and Korea, the fact that uh, the prerequisites of becoming a parent are increasingly becoming high. So we tend to raise our standards, maybe rightly so, to become parents. And becoming parents is something I mentioned is very important. It's a long-term plan. It's one of the... Uh, most irreversible decisions we will have in our life, we need to have security in the long term. If we don't have security in the long term, we don't have kids. Most irreversible decision of our lives. I couldn't agree with you more on that. Uh, now to you, Professor Huang. Uh, we've been discussing the reasons behind Korea's crawling birth rate a lot, analyzing from diverse angles. And some of the main culprits for the drastic drop in figures include heavy workload and long working hours, soaring education expenses and gender inequality, uh, imposing much heavier burden on women in and outside of their homes. Let's talk more about this and what calls for the most urgent attention. Well, it's very complicated issues. So solution must be multifaceted. 
we can say that one single solution may resolve the whole situation uh, or uh, you know, change the social trend. Uh, but uh, as you mentioned before, there's one single factor that must uh, be uh, mandated uh, to improve our uh, quality of uh, social life. That is the uh, wage difference in gender. Women uh, still get uh, lower, uh, comparatively speaking, lower uh, wage than men, uh, even though uh, they have same uh, equivalent education level and workload. What it means to uh, in our house household and the uh, married couple is uh, if male uh, husband uh, can earn more money than uh, female housewives and I mean the you know, working wives the working wives have, have have to spend more time staying at home and do the house chore and the uh, child care that is uh, even though the the wage gap uh, in the labor market uh, in gender is uh, getting improved, still significantly determine the, the ratio imbalance between the uh, house chore and child care in the couple in the household. That causes real problem. So uh, consequently, uh, if we improve the gender inequality in the labor market and wage disparity, then it automatically affect the 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 families uh, uh, balancing house chores very improve the work life balance and the husband will not have to work more and uh, extra uh, uh, workload in their uh, uh, the company or their employers. That is one single thing we have to nail down for, for the uh, from the beginning. Well, second uh, thing that we have to think about is it, uh, in the short term, migration is only resolution that will uh, improve the indicator and statistic in number. Uh, the third one is marriage. Uh, many people and uh, government decision makers still strongly believe that we have to improve the marriage. There, therefore, uh, there will be more child uh, birth. But that is very dangerous uh, reasoning because compared to Japan and Korea from my study, uh, Japanese fertility rate is very uh, stable and uh, not declining any longer since 2006. But the problem is their marriage rate is still dropping down rapidly. And uh, Korea, between Korea and uh, Japanese marriage rate is uh, about 1% point differences. That means even though marriage rate is uh, improving or uh, stop declining, still fertility rate will go down. So instead of putting more energy and effort to uh, the improving or uh, emphasizing marriages, uh, we better uh, change our strategy and, uh, and put more em emphasis and focus on the labor market and gender equality. So Korea's uh, dwindling birth rate, the lowest in the world, may be a result of a, a wide spectrum of various societal problems. But uh, you've highlighted the wage difference uh, in, uh, in gender as, as one of the main culprits. Now, staying with you, Professor Huang, let's talk a little bit about countermeasures. The Korean government has injected a staggering 380 trillion won, or roughly $284 billion, over the past 17 years, but it did little to lift the crawling figures. And what's quite odd is that the budgetary support for areas directly linked to birth and child care rather decreased, according to the National Assembly's Budget Committee. What's happening? We want to get your thoughts on this. Well, the number uh, lies a lot because uh, even though we spend lots of money, there's no uh, causality between the the spending and going spend uh, uh, in a purposive way to improve the fertility rate. The, I've studied the uh, the, the whole uh, social, uh, government budget uh, and then how much money will be spent on the improving the population structure changes. And I found that there's no uh, uh, specific causality of this policy uh, effort. Money is not where spent, or especially on uh, where to and who will get the money kind of thing. So this is a critical problem of our government spending. And uh, to improve that, we have to have a control tower that make the allocate the uh, uh, government funding spending as well as how that is uh, uh, spent and uh, uh, implemented uh, through the monitoring system. Therefore, I strongly suggest we build a strong 
uh, control tower, like for instance, the Minister of Population is uh, uh, ongoing issues in the government restructuring, uh, restructuring, and then that will uh, uh, make things change in a long term. I mean, long run. So we can't uh, rely totally on just the numbers because government's data even often are inconsistent. And you've also briefly mentioned about a control tower, but we'll talk more about that uh, in our later question. Now, moving over to Italy, one of the Korean government's countermeasures to tackle the country's plunging birth rate is boosting after-school care programs to alleviate the burden on working parents. The programs were there. They were available in the past but they'll be further extended and diversified to cater to working parents' specific needs. In your point of view, Professor Bellari, how effective would this be? And what can we learn from other advanced nations in Europe that perhaps took a similar path to tackle the issue? This is potentially a good measure. I can give you the example of Germany, where there's been an important recovery of rates. I've already mentioned the example before. Uh, money has been flowing to families with children since decades, but this didn't have a strong impact on fertility. Uh, when fertility changed, there was a, an overall set of policies uh, uh, that produced optimism from the, for the long run. One of those policies was extending school uh, hours, so very similar to the policy you're mentioning. These policies were oriented towards more gender equality, uh, towards more affordable childcare. And I think one of the challenges that could be faced by this policy is the fact that, again, let's think that becoming a parent is not only the most irreversible decision, but it's a very important decision. Children are like diamonds. They are forever. And we want to take advantage of having children. We want to see them. And so it's very important that working hours are not too extended. So the risk of uh, having after school is to extend a lot the time in which parents do not see their children. And in the new era, we need to find ways to uh, accommodate the desire for being father or mother and seeing your children. I think this is very important. And these are the kind of policies that not only require public policy, but requires private sector employers to understand that work-life balance and limiting working hours, maybe using smart work at home, are measures that are fundamental for parents today. Professor Huang, back to you. The government is also showering parents with cash, hoping it would have an immediate effect in encouraging more households to have kids. But many remain skeptical that money alone will not fix the country's fertility woes. Tell us more about these cash payouts and your thoughts on their effects. Well, everybody likes cash. But uh, cash is also a very dangerous thing. It's very toxic. Uh, the thing is, uh, who and how the money is spent is more important thing. Uh, the eminent uh, demographer, uh, Gary Coleman, mentioned the value of children. And, uh, you know, our industrial society uh, is uh, the cost of, uh, of uh, children is uh, growing up, but the value of children, that the amount of money the children will get uh, mm -hmm. money back to family is uh, declining or minus. But I would suggest the value of mother. How, how we appreciate uh, mothers. And uh, as Dr. Blair mentioned that, being father, being mother must be appreciated and we love to uh, enjoy our life as father and mothers. And uh, spending money uh, on whose side is more important. One woman has more money to spend uh, for their children and their family, but decision making must be solely uh, in the more demographic uh, and uh, on uh, patriarchal uh, family system. So, if money is spent so that uh, there's more the family cohesion and family unity is in us, I would 
agree with that. But uh, so far, our social welfare system is uh, based on individual payout instead of the family and collective payout system. It is very dangerous to, to spend, uh, I mean, uh, cash more money to uh, household. It mm -hmm. diminishes the value of mother. Dr. Bellari, Italy plans to spend over 1 billion euros on new initiatives to encourage Italian women to have more babies. The package includes various tax incentives, exemption from Social Security contributions, and more support for nurseries. All of this for women that have two children or more. How is this plan coming along, and would it be effective in reversing Italy's low figures? Uh, we're a little pressed on time, so uh, if you could shorten your answer to just about one minute. It's the right direction. Uh, Italy has a bit of a challenge uh, in public finance. So it's true that this is a big plan, but relative to the problem, it's not necessarily a big amount of money. That's why I'm mentioning also for Italy what I mentioned for Korea. It's fundamental that companies are putting their skin in the game. They have giving, they need to give more time to parents. They need to encourage workers to combine families. And this is not only for mothers. It's important also that fathers are uh, made responsible. The plan is going on well. It's also involving uh, parents in general, not only mothers, but fathers. And it's involving private sector. That's why I think it's a good direction, but it will take a long time. So fertility related policies take a long time to be realized. We need to be patient and wait maybe 10 or 20 years. That's fundamental. All right, I'm afraid we'll have to leave it there, but thank you both so much for joining our conversation. Thank you so much for that insightful conversation. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. I enjoy that. And that brings us to the end of this show. Thank you for watching and be sure to tune in same time tomorrow to join our conversation. Goodbye for now.